It is great to be together. Anybody glad to be together today? Yeah. Awesome. And it is great to have everybody in the room and everybody joining us online. It is a thrill to be able to worship together uh, no matter what like this. So uh, it's, it's great to be in this moment with you guys. I'm very excited about what God wants to do in each one of us as we turn to his word right now. Um, what if there was a, a simple change that you could make that would dramatically change what happens in your home? Would you be willing to, to move in that direction? What if there was one, one simple change you could make that would dramatically change what happens in your home? Would you be willing to move in that direction? Amen. When I was uh, growing up uh, in the Chicago area, there would be uh, snowfall after snowfall, and they would kind of pile up on top of each other. And the snowplow that would go down the road would push the snow up into our yard, and it would push more and push more. And pretty soon, there would be these pretty large mounds Probably not as big as I remember them, for I was a little smaller then, uh, but large mounds of snow in the yard. And so we would play this game in our neighborhood called King of the Hill. Anybody ever played King of the Hill? <laughs> we would play this game where you try, here's the goal. The goal is to try to get to the top and make sure you're the only one there. And so you do that by violently shoving everyone around you down the hill. Uh, and so everybody's trying to climb this hill and push everybody else down and try to get up there. And I was not the scrappiest of all of my friends. So I didn't get there. If I got close, two of them would throw me down the hill. I never could get to be the king of the hill. But I dreamed of one day, maybe. Maybe I could ascend the king of the hill and I could stand atop this massive mound of snow with my arms raised in victory and proclaim, I am the king of the hill, at least for two or three seconds before I got pummeled. Uh, I, I just wasn't, it just wasn't there for me. I just didn't have it. But I wanted it. I dreamed of being the king of the hill. And you know, as we look around our world today, we see that same value, we see that same idea being promoted that, that the best place to be, the desired place to be, is on the top of the hill. Climb to the top, that's where the good stuff is. That's where the honor and the glory are for you. And we dream of it because the way that we see it is this is where you make it. You know you've made it when you've climbed to the top of the hill where other people take your orders where other people are serving you because you're the king of the hill. It's that picture that I have in my mind of the king that's in the palace and he's laying on the pillows all reclined and there's servants all around him with the platters of food and someone's peeling the grapes, you know, and, and feeding him and he's laying there going, I'm on top and I've made it and I've arrived. That's the picture of being the king of the hill. It's the, the pinnacle of joy and satisfaction and really making it in life. And this is the picture that uh, these men that were traveling with Jesus, learning from Jesus day after day, that were invited by Jesus to do this, his disciples had the same concept of what it meant to really make it, to find life's greatest joy and satisfaction was on top of the hill, being the king of the hill. The disciples, as they were following Jesus, had this idea that, that Jesus was going to liberate them politically, that Jesus was going to lead a revolution that was going to overthrow the Roman occupation, and he would set them free, and he would set himself up as this leader and when Jesus did this, when Jesus accomplished this revolution, that these men that are following him would have the opportunity to stand on the hill next to Jesus. And they would be in their glory, and they would have the honor, and they would be seen with great status and power next to Jesus. So this is what they have in mind as they are one day traveling with Jesus, and they're headed to the city of Capernaum. And we find this in, Ma in Mark, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 9, verse uh, 33. In verse 33, it says, And they, speaking of the disciples and Jesus, came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing 
on the way because Jesus didn't like travel with all of his disciples in one little mast huddle. You would kind of spread out on the trail and some would be talking here and some here and some here. And so he was far enough away from the conversation. He heard voices, but, but he asked them, so what was it that you guys were discussing back there? Because I heard you. It sounded like it might have gotten a little heated maybe. So what were you guys talking about back there? And the verse 34, it continues, but they kept silent. They just kind of buttoned their lip and looked at him. You're going to tell him, John? You're going to tell him, Peter? I'm not telling him. And uh, it says, for on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the, what, everybody? Greatest. Who's the greatest? Is it me or is it you? Is it you, John, or is it me, Peter? Hey, Andrew, are you the greatest? You know what? I'm the greatest. And what was going on as they were walking was they were playing a verbal game of King of the Hill. I'm trying to get to the top of the heap. I want to be the greatest. I'm going to tell you why I'm better than you. No, I'm going to tell you why I'm better than you. And they were scrapping, trying to get to the top. And if one of them kind of popped out as being greater, they would try to shove them off so that they could be the greatest. And they were arguing and, and bickering among themselves about who was going to be the greatest in Jesus' new kingdom. I'm going to be the greatest because I am the greatest. I'm the goat, the greatest of all time. And then they kept silent because they were ashamed. And this is really interesting. They were ashamed because they knew in their gut that there was something wrong about trying to position themselves above everyone else. But at the same time, they felt that there was something inside of them that drew them to want to be it anyway. So they're fighting over because I want it, but if they get called on it, they're like, oh, I feel bad about this. So there's a split thing going on inside of them. I want to be the king of the hill, but I know I really shouldn't. What am I, what's going on inside of me? So there was this fighting inside and Jesus then sits down as teachers in that day would sit down when they taught. And so he sat down in verse 35, and he sat down and called the 12, come here, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all. You, you want to be the greatest? You're fighting about being the greatest? Let me tell you, here's the greatest, you're last. What? And then he hits it and servant of all. You become the servant of everybody if you want to be the greatest. And what strikes me so much about what Jesus says here is what he doesn't say. He doesn't chastise them for wanting to be great. So you guys were arguing about being great on the way here. How dare you guys try to be great? Don't try to be great. Don't try to be that... He doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, he leaves it conspicuously out that they were pursuing greatness. You know why? Because he's okay with it. He's, he's essentially saying it's okay, be great. Actually pursue greatness. Be super great. Be the greatest, go for it. But here's the thing, Jesus changes where greatness is found. He changes where greatness is found. He flips the script on them. Greatness, he says, isn't found on the top of the hill. It's found at the bottom. So pursue greatness, be great, but it's not up here where you thought it was climbing the hill. It's on the bottom helping other people climb. That's where real greatness is found. It's beautifully backwards. It's an upside down kingdom that Jesus is inviting them to live in. When someone gets the top spot in our world, when, when there's the podium and they step up on the top of the podium, applause erupts. We applaud. Well done. You got first place. Way to go. The applause of men. But the applause of heaven erupts when you and I stand not on the top of the podium, but on the bottom. When we don't climb the hill, when we stand at the bottom of the hill and let others climb and help them climb. When we become the servants, that's where all of heaven goes, well done. You're now great. Jesus is redefining victory for us, contrary to the way that our world defines victory and even the way our hearts perhaps have defined victory. 
Jesus redefines what's worthy of our best energy and what greatness looks like. Jesus calls us to be great. Serve. Be great. Don't be mediocre. But it doesn't mean you climb the hill and you win first place. It means you climb down and you serve everybody. That's how you become great. So become great and serve. It's counterintuitive because Jesus is calling us to live according to a different set of values, a different set of standards, a different mindset, the mindset and the values and the priorities of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. And here's the amazing part. When we do, when we step out of what's in it for me, how can I get to the top? How can I be the king with the people, with the servants, and they're serving me, and then I've made it? How? When I step out of that, guess what really happens to me? When I become the greatest by serving everyone else, I am going to experience blessing as I serve. I'm going to experience that things begin to work better in my life. I'm going to experience that my relationships actually change when I become the servant in the relationship. And my relationships are going to change, especially in my home, when I truly become a servant. This month, we've been looking at our homes, and we've been looking to the the truth in God's word to direct us in, in how to build our homes. It's very easy to wreck our homes. And we're looking at five ways we can wreck our homes this month in, in so that we can shift that and build our homes on a foundation that comes from the word of God. And, and why is this so critical for us? Because everything in our lives is affected by what happens at home. If things are good at home, we're, we're better and stronger outside of the home. But if things are not so good at home, it steals our energy, it changes our interactions, it changes our attitude, all for the worse. What happens at home really makes a difference. And so I want you to imagine if gracious and joyful serving was the consistent attitude and action of your home. Imagine it. Just just picture it for a moment. If consistently there is this joyful willingness to serve one another in your home. Some of you would just pass out right now if that were to happen. I understand. Just picture it. Would anything change? What would it look like? What would your interactions look like? What would the tone of voice look like? How would the interactions take place? What would happen in your house? Would it change anything if that became the consistent norm if those actions and attitudes were were flowing from this gracious and joyful desire to serve one another, would the atmosphere in your home change at all if that were the case? Jesus calls us to be great to serve. And, And even in our homes, especially in our homes, is where we need to see this take place. I don't know if you've noticed this, and maybe you're different than me, and I, I hope that you are, For many reasons, but I'll just give you one. It's a lot easier to serve outside the home. And I can show up and do ministry here. I can go there and I can bless that person. And that person, oh, I can really just help them. But when I go home, you take care of yourself. This is where I relax. This is where I get my needs taken care of and and you just figure it out for yourself. It's a lot easier to take that attitude than when I go home. How can I serve? And so there's this call of Jesus on our lives as disciples of Jesus, that we would be the servant of all, including those at work, those at church, those in our neighborhood, those at the restaurant, and those in the walls of our home, to become servant of all, to become great. And and so there's, there's four responses that I want to look at that we might have when we hear that from Jesus. And the first one, We'll put on the screen is this, but I already do. (laughs) You should see my life. You should see how I serve constantly and it's killing me. It's all I do. 
I just serve at home and serve at home and I just do and do and do and do and I'm exhausted. If servants are great, then I am super duper great because that's what I do. That's all I do. And if that is the case for you, if that would be your response, then I, then I want to give you three suggestions. And the first one is really simple. It's this. Then ask for help. Ask for help. If your response to serve is you want me to do more than I'm doing? I'm, I'm at my end. All I do is serve and give all the time. What I want to let you know is it's okay to ask for help. Don't be a martyr and kill yourself doing everything yourself and then blame everyone else for not helping. Look at all that I do and nobody helps me. Make sure at the outset you realize you can ask and you need to ask for help. It's much like in our relationship with God where he tells us, you don't have. Why? Because you don't ask. Maybe the first step for some of us is just simply saying, I need some help. Will you help? The second thing I want to tell you, if your response is, but I already do, is this. Go ahead and recharge your batteries. Please. Please recharge your batteries. Please, please realize that recharging your batteries is not slacking. But I can't stop. I got to keep going. I got to keep making this happen. I can't. I got to. If I stop for a minute, I feel so guilty because I've got more to do. Stop anyway. Stopping and recharging your batteries is not slacking. It's necessary for you to do that. If, if you feel bad for taking a break, I want to invite you to consider this that one of the best ways that you can possibly become great and serve well is by recharging your ability to serve well. I have a cordless drill at home, and it's great, it's portable, and it helps me do a lot of things. It's a great tool, it serves me well, but when the batteries start to wear out, it starts to go a little bit slower, and then it starts making the noise. It starts to sound really bad, right? It goes slower. It sounds really bad. And, and then it just kind of quits. And it's, it's just really, really not very helpful in that moment. I've got four more screws I need to put into this project, and it's, it's not going to make it happen. It's not very helpful. And it just needs to be recharged because then it can become more effective and helpful. And Maybe you've noticed that when you're run down, you move a little slower and you start making funny noises. Have you noticed this? Maybe some people in your home have noticed when you're tired, you go to open the door and you're like, ah. you, just, you just make weird noises because your batteries are, you start making noises, it's a sure sign. You need recharge. And, and here's the big part of it, you become less helpful. You know this about the people in your home. When they are low on energy and they need to be recharged, they are less than helpful, aren't they? Would you just get out of the way? <laughs> Don't open your mouth again. You're not helping, right? Because your batteries are spent and you're like, no, but I got to keep going. No, you don't. You're ruining everything. Please go plug in and recharge. That's why I say, go ahead and recharge, please. We need you to serve. You're called to serve, but you are not doing your job if your batteries are empty. So please plug in and recharge. Everyone will thank you. And most importantly, if, you're, if your response to Jesus is, but I already do, and I'm exhausted from this, most importantly, check your heart. Check your heart. Ask for help, yes. Recharge your batteries, yes. But check your heart. True serving doesn't start with your hands. It starts with your heart. This is what matters most when it comes to serving because serving is the activity of love. Love in motion is called serving. If you truly care, if you truly love, the activity that springs from that is going to be serving every human being you can, that you see. You become a servant of all if you love. But if you don't have the love, then the activity of non-love will not be serving. 
It has to start here in our hearts. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. They belong up the hill, not me. In verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Take an interest in the interest of others. Saying this, what you need is more important than what I want. What you need is more important than what I want. If that was the underlying attitude and sentiment of every one of us, our homes would be radically different. What you need is more important than what I want. This is the heart of a servant looking for the needs of others before my wants. The the key to being a servant is changing our question from this. Do I have to? Or can I get rid of this? Can, I don't have to do this. Do I, how do I get out of this? Do I have to? Can I get out of this? Changing it to this question. To build our home, we ask this question. How do I best serve in this moment? In this moment, how do I best serve? How do I best contribute? How do I best bring good into that person's life? In every scenario, it's going to look a little bit different. Sometimes the best way to serve my wife is to leave the room and don't say anything. (laughs) And she celebrates. And sometimes it is, let 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 me say this because you need to hear this. And sometimes it is just sit and listen. It changes depending on the need. So the question has to change. Do I have to? Can I get out of this? to how do I best serve you in this moment? If that becomes our question, if that is the change that takes place in our home, our homes will be radically different. There's a lie that gets in our way. And that lie is this, that the sweet spot in life that we all should aspire to is when I get to stop serving. One day, I'll I'll quit serving at work. And I'll be done with that and life will be sweet and peaceful and joyful because I will be able to focus completely on what I want. And one day, maybe I'll be able to stop having to serve anyone else and I can do all the things I want to do and that's where bliss will come rushing into my life. And unfortunately, in the back of our minds, many of us are carrying that as a truth. And we're pushing for that. And we're asking in the moment, if I can get out of serving, it'll be better. My life will be sweeter if I can just, do I have to? Oh, they're probably going to want. So if I go over there, I won't have to. And then I can do whatever I want. And that is where life is found. In doing whatever I want to do. If you want to wreck your home, be the king of the hill. Look how you can climb to the top and how you can make it with everybody letting you do what you want. And it won't only wreck your home, it'll wreck your life because there's no truth in it. See, if you want to build your home, you've got to grab the truth and get rid of that lie that the best way to exist as you were designed by your creator to live, is actively pursuing what is best for someone else. That's really hard to believe until you try it. When you spend your best on helping someone else climb the hill rather than climb the hill yourself, when you ask the question, what do you need It's more important than what I want, and you move and you act on that. You will find that it is the best way to exist, that this is the way I was meant to live, and this is where the blessing and the fullness of life is found in giving myself away for the sake of other people and for the sake of the gospel. To live that way requires a dependence on the Holy Spirit of God to let go of the what about me's. Because at the end of the day, too often we enter in with the mindset of wanting to be a servant, but we exit 
by asking the question, that's nice, but what about me? When's it my turn? When do I get mine? And the moment you do that, you throw down any servanthood that you had and you begin climbing the hill because you've rebought into the lie that the good stuff, the sweet spot of life is when I get what I want and I can focus on what I want. This is all good. I'm glad I've helped everybody else out. But when's it my turn? When do I get mine? Surefire way to strip yourself of the heart of a servant and to begin wrecking your home. The second response is this, but I don't feel like it. I know I should serve. I know that they need but I don't wanna, I don't feel like it. And there's a couple of reasons why. One can be you're tired and you need to recharge. Another one is because you're ticked. And I know that doesn't happen in anybody else's house, but you get ticked and you get frustrated and you go, I don't feel like serving you right now. <laughs> Actually, I can think of a lot of other things I want to happen to you right now. <laughs> serving you is not one of them. I know I should serve, but it's the last thing I want to do. When I was newly married and very insightful about you know, marriage, um, I remember I was upset with my wife, and I can only imagine, I don't remember what it was, but I can only imagine today that it was something very piddly and ridiculous. And I remember she was in the living room and I was in the kitchen and I was just mad. You know, she should be like this and she's not. Why isn't she like this? She should be like me because, you know, that's the way everybody should be. You know, just something really ridiculous. And I remember seeing the dishes in the sink. And I don't know what prompted me to do it. But I decided she's not going to wash the dishes. I'm going to wash them. And I just did it. And I, it's not like because I'm just so great. I just decided, I'm, I, I don't know why, I did it. And as I'm washing these dishes what I begin to realize is that my attitude towards my wife is changing. And by the time I finished those dishes, the bitterness had been scrubbed from inside. And I felt my heart leaning towards her, caring more about her than me. It was a strange transfer Jesus gives us this, this principle of wherever your treasure is, their heart will be there as well. And I, and I think it's tied together somehow that as I put my energy into something to serve someone, my heart's going to follow. And it was surprising to me that day, but I learned a valuable lesson that whenever I don't feel like serving, you know what the cure is? Serve anyway. That's what I need to do more than anything else to get my heart to follow. You see, because... Feelings follow action. Your feelings are a result of what you believe and what you do. And, and if you act and believe that you love and that you care and you act as a servant, guess what your heart's going to do? It's going to go, I guess you do, and I do care. And so when your heart is not in a place of servanthood, we simply say, I'm going to serve my heart into wanting to serve. So when you don't feel like it, do it anyway. It's going to be very interesting in your home. All of a sudden, there's going to be all kinds of things that are done around the house, and you're like, who's mad at me? Because <laughs> it's working. Uh, so the third one is this, a third response. It sounds good. Let's do it. I'm in. I got it. And if that's your response, there's a good chance that you think that you are being a servant by not burdening anybody else. Here's how you really become a great servant. You make sure nobody gets burdened around you, and you serve like crazy. You don't let anyone help. When you're doing something, they're like, hey, can I help you with that? You're like, no, 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 no. Don't want to burden you. I got it. I got it. I got it. No, I'm good. Yep, yep, yep. Can I help? No, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm good. We're good. I got it. The problem with that is this, that Scripture calls us, specifically in Galatians chapter 5, 13, it says, serve one another. We're called to mutually serve. That you need to become great by serving, and so do I. And when I block you from serving so that I can become great, I actually do you a disservice and stop serving you by not letting you serve. And so this idea that I got it and I don't want to burden you by asking for your help or giving you any opportunity to serve is actually doing them a disservice. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is let somebody help because they need it. And you actually love them most by saying, yes, 
you can serve me. It's going to cost me my pride. I'm going to have to humble myself, and I'm going to have to climb down the hill, and I'm going to say, yes, you can help even me. The last response I want to point out is this, but I don't have anyone to serve. Maybe, maybe you live in your home by yourself, and you're saying, I don't have anybody to serve in my house, so I guess I just can't do that. If this, is, if this is you, you don't have anybody else that lives in your home with you, my suggestion to you is this. Make your home a home base for serving. Serve out of your home. Serve others by being at home and sending a handwritten note, which is a huge deal in today's world. Making a phone call or sending a text or an instant message uh, or, or, or send a gift of some sort. Do something from your home where you can export, I care and I want to help you, I want to encourage you from my home base. So when I go home, I launch service from my home. Just because no one else lives in your home doesn't mean you can't serve from your home. We can serve in and from our homes. What would change if you began to see your home as a home base for serving outside of your home? What if when we went home, we said, you know what? God, I, I need your help. I want to be great. I want to serve when I walk through these doors. Whether people are there or not, this is my home base for serving. And while I'm here, I'm going to ask the question, what's the best way to serve in this moment? Greatness is found on top of the hill. It is not found on top of the hill, it's found at the bottom of the hill as we, we help others. And Jesus says, serve and be great. Yet there's this gravity of sin that draws us to ourselves and to neglecting others. And there's something inside of us that says, but I just want it what's for me and I want me and I need help turning away from that. I need your power, Holy Spirit, to help me turn away from making it about me and making it about others. And one helpful step that we can take to redirect ourselves towards the design of God for us to serve is this, to serve without recognition. To serve without recognition. It, it, it is when no one's watching to say thank you or no one's there to applaud you or affirm you and it keeps our, our motives pure when we serve without the opportunity for recognition. And so here's the challenge. I, I've issued challenge last week. We're going to issue challenges in the weeks to come. And our challenge this week for all of us is this, to do just that, to serve in or from your home by tomorrow evening without recognition, without recognition. Do something that benefits someone else, something you don't typically do. This is not in your normal routine. And do it in a way or at a time you cannot get a thank you. By tomorrow night, church, serve help in a way that's not normal, you don't typically do, in a way or at a time that you can't get a thank you. And I want you to stop right now and I want you to think about what that might be. Because just hearing that and going, that's a good idea, and then coming back next week and not having done it won't mean a thing. So what's it going to look like? What's, what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? What could you do? Some way you could help in a way, at a time, you can't get a thank you. That's your challenge. And here's what Pastor Tim Keller says. That ser servanthood begins where gratitude and applause end. This is where we really become servants when there's no opportunity for us to have wrong motives, where gratitude and applause just aren't a part of it. And here's what I wanna just invite you to do is to, to watch what happens in you when you do it. Watch what changes in you. Watch what changes in your heart when you do this. You will find something changing inside of you you will begin to respond emotionally to what you are choosing to do. Grace, greatness is not found at the top of the hill. However, there was one servant that climbed a hill, not to impress, 
but to serve. And when he got to the top of the hill, he was called a king, but not king of the hill. He was called king of the Jews. And on that hill, looking to our interests, not asking what he wanted, but what we needed. Jesus was nailed to a cross and he took your sin and my sin upon himself. He sacrificed his life to save ours. Jesus showed us what true greatness looks like. May his example remind us to do exactly the same, to be great and to choose the needs of those around us over what we want as we become the servant of all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for showing us what it means to serve. Thank you for teaching us that the greatest way to live is not on the top of the hill, but at the bottom, helping others to climb. And right now, as we continue to pray, if your desire today is to truly love the people around you and to put that love into motion by serving, then join me in this, would you, as we ask for his help. Lord, help us to serve. Help us to let go of the lie that says the best is when I get served. Help us to build our homes and to serve without recognition, Lord. Lord, I pray that all of us would be able to take that step with your help of serving without recognition by tomorrow night. Thank you for what you're going to do in us. Thank you for what you're going to do through us. Thank you for what you're doing in our homes by helping us to follow you. Jesus showed us what true greatness is by serving us on the cross and he did so that your sin could be forgiven. That, that your sin could be wiped away and you could be reconnected in a personal relationship with God Almighty, your creator, who made you, who loves you, who sent Jesus so that you and he could be reconnected for all eternity. And today, if you know in your heart, you know you need a relationship with God, but you don't have one. And you know that your sin stands in the way, but you're ready to turn from your sin and trust Jesus to forgive you of your sin. And you're ready to put your faith in him right now. And I'm gonna invite you simply to express your heart to God and to receive his invitation to come and let him embrace you and forgive you and make you his own for all eternity. So if that's you, I wanna pray this prayer and I'm just gonna invite you in the quietness of your heart to simply pray it along with me, but to pray it from your heart. Would you join me? Dear God, I admit that I am a sinner and I ask you now for forgiveness. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sin and that you raised him from the dead three days later. I choose to turn from my sin and turn to Jesus now. And I invite you to come into my heart and my life. I wanna trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior from this day forward. Thank you for saving me today. It's in your name, Jesus, that I trust and pray. And all God's people said, amen. And would you celebrate with those who gave their lives to Christ today? Amen.